Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, always, it's always great, uh, actually, for me to be in Montreal. This is absolutely one of my favorite cities. Um, and so I do appreciate uh, your time today. And, and I'm really here uh, to talk to you uh, about a topic that is, is very top of mind, not only for us at SAS, uh, but for a lot of marketing organizations uh, that I talk to around Canada. Um, so as the practice lead for our customer intelligence solution here in Canada, it's really my primary responsibility to understand and have a pulse on what's going on in marketing within Canada. So I do have uh, a full uh, Canadian responsibility, uh, which obviously includes uh, La Belle Provence. So I'm here to talk to you today about really enabling what we call an omni-channel uh, customer experience. So um, based on you know, my, my grade 12 French, um, I, I was able to discern that there's been a lot of talk about multi-channel, there's been a lot of talk uh, during the morning sessions around customer experience. Um, I know there are some uh, prior presenters that share my view of, of big data uh, not being new. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, so really, the, the lens that I want to start off our conversation this morning with, or actually I guess afternoon, it is officially afternoon, is that before we dive into this, we really need to understand the backdrop of the conversation. And the backdrop of the conversation really has to involve the overall evolution of our, of our consumer or our customer. Um, not to say that our customers are Neanderthals, uh, but if you look at you know, the existing generations today that we market to, and you compare differences between the upcoming millennials and Gen Y right through to the boomers, you see a huge difference in terms of how um, our engagement as customers and how our engagement with those customers as marketing organizations has changed because of digital. It's no longer that they're just digitally empowered, they are nonstop ever connected. And so trying to compete for their attention in a world that is inundating them with information, with offers, uh, with just overall visuals um, that could probably start a whole new generation of ADD um, is, is really where we struggle as marketers today. So the, the second lens that I would add is that in the conversation that I'm having with marketing organizations, there has been a fundamental shift in the way we approach marketing and organizationally how we're beginning to structure ourselves. Um, it, it used to be and, and still exists in many organizations where we have a very strong emphasis on the product or the service that we're selling. And there's a shift that's occurring where we are now becoming more customer centric, more customer focused. Uh, I'm starting to see over the last, I'd say three to five years, an evolution in new titles in marketing and service organizations. There's now new SVPs, VPs, directors of customer experience. Five to 10 years ago, you would never have seen that title. It would have been quite a bleeding edge organization to have that type of focus. And so now the lens with which we begin to look external becomes the lens of our customer. And that's important. The rally cry has become that we need to take that customer experience focus and putting the customer at the center uh, is really a means of sustainably differentiating ourselves from our competition. So how many of you here are from financial services, insurance? I know there, there's quite a mix of, of folks here today, but when you think about financial services in Canada, um, growth for a financial services organization is happening with new immigrants to Canada and students. Everything else between those two disparate groups or segments is cannibalism of each other's customers. So where we need to differentiate from a financial services insurance perspective is at the service and advice level. It's no longer at the product level. I can get a visa from anybody. I can get a mortgage from anybody, right? So now it's about why do I want to come to you as a particular financial institution? So in today's road, uh, SAS uh, specifically is, is really focused on helping to build that next generation customer intelligent organization, right? And so when we say the term customer intelligent, it really spans more than just traditional marketing. Because when you think about how marketing is defined, whether it's the four Ps or the sort of typical uh, multi-channel engagement, 
What it doesn't take into consideration is all of the avenues or opportunities that we have to interact with our customers that reside outside of marketing, right? So we do this through three core uh, enablers or, or core pillars, if you will. Uh, first and foremost, it's around providing an integrated omni-channel uh, experience, and I'll get into a little bit more detail about that. Um, next, it's really doing client level and organizational level optimization. So no longer looking, putting our blinders on and focused within a single particular campaign. And then last but not least, it's really digitally enabling uh, those consum the consumers um, in, in your business. <coughs> so the term omnichannel, uh, any retailers in the room? I know I saw a few. Oh, there we go, at the back. <laughs> Probably working on the next, uh, the next big marketing initiative, I bet. <laughs> um, so the term omnichannel is a term that was really uh, born uh, and since borrowed from retail. Um, and so when we use the term omnichannel, um, there's, there's a very close uh, comparison to multi-channel, and oftentimes you'll hear people talk about omni-channel and multi-channel almost synonymously. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that multi-channel doesn't take into account all of the multiple customer touch points that you have within your organization. So as you look at the, the circle here around omni-channel engagement, it of course incorporates all of the traditional touch points uh, or vehicles or modes of delivery that you have for the marketing communications that you're delivering. But what multi-channel doesn't take into consideration is the various operational functions that have an impact on overall customer experience. So I'll use a banking example. Um, and, and I'm using banking examples not because there's an overabundance of bankers in the room, but because it's the one thing that we all share in common is that we're all banking customers. Right, so we can all trade scars and war stories around our, our banking institutions. Um, so when we start looking at the operational functions, let's say for example, I'm a customer and I'm going onto your website um, and I'm beginning to play with your mortgage calculator. Right? I put in some really round numbers, 300,000, 320,000, and I'm playing with it here and there. Right? Then I begin to go onto that mortgage calculator a little bit more frequently and the numbers that I'm putting in become a little bit more exact. It's now $321,095 or $323,050, right? There are analytic inferences that you can make there if you're capturing that data, but you cannot act in the moment of truth with your customer unless you have access to the operational functions that impact whether or not you would want to offer them a mortgage. Right? So if this person has been flagged for fraud, that's probably going to negate them from a mortgage offer. You're not going to want to incentivize them to come into the branch and get a mortgage with you. If they've got poor credit, again, you're not going to want to extend a mortgage to somebody with poor credit. Right? And there's a multitude of examples that we could walk through there um, as well. <coughs> So when we look at the three core enablers of creating that overall customer, uh, omni-channel customer experience, first and foremost, it's around the customer uh, information. Um, customer information is critical. I know the term big data is, is really quite a buzzword. Um, I think there's probably a lot of vendors that are doing a little fear-mongering around that. Um, but quite frankly, my perspective is that big data is not new. Right? We've always had big data. You ask any bank. Um, who's collected more information on all of us than probably any organization did before the convergence of big data. I think what's different is that, yes, there's more, but we have an opportunity to identify what the right data is. So just because there's a plethora of data doesn't mean that we have to act, use, or somehow consume all of that data. But what we do need to do is round out robust customer information so that we're making the best decision possible based on the information that we have. The next really is around customer analytics, right? So this is sort of, uh, I define this almost as three core pillars. The first being capture, which is really that customer information, bringing all the information you have about your customer together. The second pillar really being around the customer analytics, which is from a marketing perspective, simply the ability to comprehend what the data is saying, right? Um, I'm not a data scientist, I'm not a stat, I'm not a quant, I'm a prior marketer, and I work for SAS, 
Um, a lot of people think SaaS is complex and that you have to be an uber geek to use it. That's not true. Um, but what customer analytics does from a marketer's perspective is allow you to actually visually see the insights the data is telling you, right? So whether or not somebody is uh, likely to respond or whether somebody has um, the right credentials or the right profile to extend this offer to them. And then last but not least is sort of the third pillar, which is really around customer decisions, right? So once you can comprehend or capture the information, once you comprehend what that data is telling you, you can then act decisively based on solid information. And as marketers, we're being held more accountable, more and more accountable. And it's not accountable for driving more leads and looking at those types of typical volume metrics that we used to look at five to ten years ago, it's really around revenue generation. So marketing is no longer a cost center. It's a revenue generator. And there's a shift occurring if it hasn't already occurred within your organization in terms of what is marketing doing to drive revenue for the company, right? So having the right balance there of all your customer information, the insight around that customer, and balancing that against the needs of the organization is critical and fundamental to the overall omni-channel. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to skip through that build. All right. So SAS recently engaged in uh, a study. I'm going to put this somewhere where it might not fall. Uh, we, we surveyed um, several hundred uh, marketers. Actually, I think it was probably over 1,000. Uh, back in the fall uh, of 2013, and we've spent the last, uh, you know, little while sort of going through some of that data, and, and some of that data was really, really interesting, and we looked at it um, at an aggregate sort of um, independent of industry or vertical perspective, but then we also looked further within particular verticals or particular sectors. So what was really interesting here is that Canadian companies really feel as though they're already managing a lot of customer data, but when you look at the statistics in terms of our comparison to the, our U.S. counterparts, obviously our volume of data uh, is significantly less. So that, that was something that was interesting that we, we seem to be sort of right there, round in the middle. Uh, but then another core component was the customer information um, and what they plan to do with that customer information. And so ultimately as we look at some of the statistics here, there's a plan to add more. Whew. Anybody remember the Lion King movie? When I hear big data, I always think of that the hyenas going, ooh, big data, say it again. Because again, it's a, it's a fear mongering that's driving people to think they need more and more data, but it's not more data, it's right data. Um, and so it was interesting to see that those survey results sort of uh, helped to summarize that. So as we look um, a little bit more across industry, and again, looking at U.S. versus uh, Canadian counterparts and, and really how they're viewing themselves, you can see that the telcos here in Canada, interestingly enough, were the least satisfied with their data availability. Not surprising if you think about every time you drop a call and your telco provider proactively calls you after three drop calls to apologize and offer you a credit. That happened to anybody? Just saying. Um, but interestingly, too, the Canadian retailers have a low opinion of their data quality, uh, which I found really interesting um, given some of the interesting things that are happening around loyalty programs here in Canada with retail, um, that, that, was, that that was so, uh, and that was different from their U.S. counterparts as well. Sort of looking towards that, the, the customer analytics side um, of, of the enablers. One of the, the core aspects that prevents uh, customer analytics, um, and I'm using banking here as an example because it is so tried and true in terms of how organizationally they're structured to prohibit omnichannel uh, customer engagement, is that fundamentally physical silos still exist within the organization. So when I use that that online banking example earlier around incentizing someone who is clearly moments away from buying a home to come into your bank and get their mortgage through you, this is what's preventing that type of real-time customer engagement because the silos of data have not yet been torn down or are in the process of being to torn down, right? But until we have clear line of sight into some of those core and critical operational functions, 
we're going to have to continue to crawl, walk, run to get there. Interestingly enough, too, as, as we look at the evolution of analytics, it's becoming clear um, that the client level optimization is really uh, what people are, 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 are honed in and focused in on um, from a laser perspective. And so it's, it's no longer uh, what's this particular campaign and what's the best channel. It's really looking at, analytically speaking, what's the best offer for this particular customer in what channel at what time, right? And that can be both a proactive or a reactive uh, type of campaign uh, development. So, you know, oftentimes I'll hear responsive design not only referred to in terms of the user interface in which it's delivered to being able to adapt to the various confinements of different user interfaces, but responsive design in terms of your overall campaign and responding to the needs of individual customers rather than doing sort of prey and spray, if you will. <coughs> so as we look at sort of the last of the core enablers here, really around the, the customer decisions, this is where we start to look, and I'll build this out. I apologize that this will be an eye chart or a test for those of you sitting in the back of the room. Um, but there has been an evolution, and, and this is something that SAS has, has spent a lot of time working with our customers and our prospects in really understanding how they're evolving their overall marketing organization. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we all started at the same point. We all started with some customer information that might have been in a particular product, a particular segment, a particular channel, and then we look to move that into being a little bit more customer intelligent, right? And so that, that started to bring a little bit of consistency around the customer, perhaps within a single chan channel. So we got really good at, at mail inserts, or we got really good at targeted email. But our online strategy kind of fell flat because it was very much one-to-many versus one-to-one, -one, right? Then we start looking into the making the customer intelligent decisions, right? So that's really leveraging some of the analytics that some of you may not even know exist within your organization. And, and trust me, you don't need to touch them, but they can be interpreted on your behalf to help drive intelligent uh, customer decisions. And then last, we started to look into this, this really sort of utopian phase, um, is what I call it, sort of where we all want to get to as marketers. And depending on where you are within your marketing organization, you may very well be in various parts of this roadmap or this maturity. Um, you know, you may have, if you're a bank, for example, cards may be further along the maturity curve than lending. Um, so it, it's not necessarily consistent across. But what we're all striving to achieve is striking the right balance from an optimization perspective between what's best for our customer and what's best for us as an organization as well as engaging our customers, not just at the, in real time, but at the right time, so in the moment. So recognizing that customer on your website playing with your mortgage calculator and being able to quickly and decisively determine whether or not we want to push something to them at that moment to incentize them to get to the branch and apply for their mortgage. Here. No, one more build. Um, so sort of looking back at, at some of the survey data there, we, we, we asked a lot of the respondents uh, about some of their campaign uh, areas of focus and channel focus, and I thought this would be interesting for you to see um, how we're sort of assessing ourselves as Canadian marketers versus the U.S., because there are some, some pretty unique differences as we look uh, across. In this particular example, no shock, the volume of campaigns is increasing, right? So it's do more with less and less time with less resources. Um, but we're continuing to see that trend go upward, that the, the volume of campaigns is increasing. And so as we move to that more client-optimized, uh, real-time, right-time uh, environment, that's where we see the volume of campaigns skyrocketing, but the ease of which you should be able to execute those um, should be rel relatively simplified if you've got the right underlying framework or structure to support that. Um, we also see here that the expansion of channels uh, is continuing. So again, depending on industry vertical, that may be a little bit skewed. You know, as, as Canadians, we're very much the conservative financial customer. Uh, but I think as 
the tipping point occurs, generationally speaking, we're starting to demand of our financial institutions that we go from less bricks to more clicks uh, because we want to do more on our mobile devices. We want to do more online. And so when we look at the campaign capabilities, drilling into what the marketers are, are really looking at, um, you can see here in terms of the top priority um, is really around uh, driving offers across channels using real-time information. So that gets back to that banking example calculator where we're able to respond in real time. So while we've got that kind of that prospective customer uh, in real that's a continual focus industry for, for all the marketers that we're talking to. There's a, a particular focus uh, within the U.S. as well around that. New acquisition, again, remains a, a key target, and I think depending on industry, uh, there may be some uh, cannibalization. Um, we're going to continue to always have net new acquisition targets. Uh, I don't think that's ever going to go away, um, but I think we need to start looking at incentivizing uh, our marketing organizations to really ensure that we're also supporting and growing our existing customer base um, because the volume of, of new immigrants and the youth segment that are really becoming the net new opportunities for us uh, as marketers um, is not necessarily the biggest, widest pond to fish from. And so as you look here across uh, the U.S. And, and some of the global folks that we interviewed as well, you can see that Canada still has um, a significantly higher focus on net new customer acquisition. So that was a, an interesting difference there. It's still a top priority. But gross sales and gross income are quickly growing in terms of, of prioritization. And so again, going back to uh, being held more accountable and, and becoming that, that revenue generator versus a cost center, uh, we're starting to see that statistically represent itself. So in terms of the client level uh, cross-organization optimization, um, I'm just going to build this out for simplicity's sake here. Um, really, it's about putting the customer at the center of everything you do within your organization. Um, and that's not just from a marketing perspective, that's from a customer service perspective, um, it's from a pricing strategy perspective. Uh, if you're in uh, banking or, or financial institutions, that's also from a risk and a fraud perspective as well, to bring those operational functions together so that you can drive differentiated pricing strategies uh, or, you know, play a little bit with risk tolerances based on the fact that somebody is, has a high lifetime pro, um, uh, value to your organization. Um, but it's also being able to ensure that we're doing consistent coordinated customer contact across all of those channels. Um, so it's more than next best offer. Next best offer is very much a marketing term. I'm going to extend an offer to my customer. I hope they're gonna uptake that offer. That's part of it. But next best action really incorporates all those various touch points that may interact with a customer that may arbitrate that an offer is not the right thing to do at this particular point, right? So if I'm a customer of a telco, which I know we're all customers of telcos here, um, if I call into the call center, right, they may have three offers that are pre-staged waiting in, lie in, in wait for me. Um, and that's great might be accurate, might be off, not quite sure. But if I call in an I'm irate, I've had three drop calls in the last month, the last thing I wanna hear is, oh hey, you know, if you upgrade your data plan from one gig to six gig, you can save. I don't care, it's not what I'm calling about, right? It immediately begins to impact my customer experience and your customer satisfaction scores. So anybody here a net promoter score um, user doing any types of customer satisfaction surveys to drive level of customer satisfaction, right? So bringing those operational functions in and informing all channels, not just the marketing channels, becomes critical to drive improved customer sat. So nowhere is the voice of the consumer more prominent than in a digital age. I was gonna do that as a voiceover, but that just really didn't work very well. <laughs> I'll apologize. I know I'm standing between you guys and lunch. <laughs> um, but again, just to use a, a digital bank, uh, just as an example, um, we found these statistics really quite compelling. Um, you know, when, when outsiders look into Canada, they think, oh wow, those Canadians, they're so financially 
conservative. You know, they managed to weather the storm through the recession and, and all of those things. And oh, they'll, they'll never embrace some of the things that they're doing over in Asia. So to them, I say, <clears throat> we have got increasingly more demand from the consumers and customers within Canada to drive mobile and to drive digital engagement than ever before. And so our banks are beginning to look at what they're doing overseas. Look at what they're doing in Australia. So Westpac Bank, for example, um, who's enabled a full real-time next best action environment uh, for their customers in Australia. You know, or if you begin to look at some of uh, what the Asian banks are doing from a mobile perspective, it becomes really compelling. And so as we start to see, I think now two Canadian banks release a mobile pay app versus just somewhere where you can go and transfer funds from one account to another, we're now seeing the war for the mobile data, the mobile wallet data begin. The telcos are competing for it and the banks are competing for it because the volume of data that's available then to use to retarget and remarket and become more contextual and more relevant in the moment and serve up those geolocation-based offers and incentives, that's king, that's gold. So as, as, again, as we sort of look at the, the digital um, enablement, digital is a, a core component of omni-channel, um, but again, omni-channel is moving beyond just multi-channel. So we need to look at our digital channels, not just as marketing avenue, avenues, but also customer service opportunities, right? Um, so, you know, if you have a, a bad travel experience, you can call the 188 customer service number and stay on hold for 20 minutes while you wait to make a complaint, or you can tweet, and they will respond faster. Um, I think we saw that with United Airlines and the guitar catastrophe, if everybody remembers that video. That was a great video. <laughs> but so as we start to look at those traditional channels and those digital channels, we need to be looking at them with the lens of the opportunity they provide us within overall customer engagement, which is, again, more than just the marketing function. But it's core to our overall multi-channel strategy, certainly. And one of the reasons that we have to consider digital is because it is so vastly different um, than the traditional channels with which we all began our careers engaging. Um, I know when I began my career, we didn't send emails to people to market. We were starting to look at that. And I might date myself a little bit there, but we were still living and breathing, spitting out a list to give to a fulfillment or a mail house so they could kit the direct mail piece. So it was old school, but now digital becomes a two-way engagement. It's like an open door, like Monsters, Inc. It opens a door into a whole other world. You can tell I have kids, right? Um, that allows you to engage and allows you to get feedback in the moment. And sometimes that feedback is crickets. It's nothing, but that's information. That's information that whatever you put out there, that particular individual was not interested at that particular moment in time. Push it aside, try something new, right? It's great, it's a good learning tool for us, um, but it also can, has the opportunity to become viral, right? So that's where we need to strike that balance between what's right and what could potentially work against us, right? So you look at what WestJet did over the holidays, did everybody see that Santa video, okay, I'm the cry at the Hallmark commercial girl. I bawled, I absolutely bawled my eyes out. But what brilliant marketing. And what happened? It went viral and it worked to their advantage. But that just as easily, if they hadn't done it right, could have worked to their disadvantage, right? So those are all things that we need to take into account in terms of how we're impacting that customer service. So despite, the proliferation of digital channels and the explosion of digital data and all of the other fear-mongering terms that, that we all like to use these days, digital rem remains a part of an ecosystem. So it is not the end-all, be-all with which we execute our, our marketing plans and strategies and objectives. It is a part of an ecosystem. 
So we need the ability to look across that ecosystem and intelligently determine what's the right avenue to engage and when. If you engage my parents online or via email, they're gonna think you're running a Nigerian scam. They will. You're gonna freak out. They're gonna call Peel Regional Police in Mississauga and say, somebody's trying to hack into our banking information. If you engage me through email or online, I'm significantly more apt to respond. In fact, if you send me direct mail, it goes right in the recycling bin, even if it's personally addressed to me, because I know it's prey and spray marketing at the end of the day. The email and the online have the opportunity with the wealth of data that's available to be contextual, to be relevant, to be in the moment. And so it's interesting to see here sort of the, the, the evolution and the, the breakout of how those channels really fit in. And so th I think that the part of the ecosystem that's important is that it is necessitating that integrated approach. Because if you think about all of us as, as banking customers, for example, we may have a day, a single day, where we may touch, talk to, or interact with our bank five or more times. We may have days where we don't interact with them at all. But if they're able to capture that information intraday, in real time, it makes those days when we're dealing with our bank on multiple occasions that less of a headache, that less frustrating, and that much more relevant. And it makes you, as a consumer, feel as though they're seeing you as a, as a customer as an individual and not as a, an account number. Uh, the, the coaching that I give a, lo a lot of marketers and, and especially of slightly larger organizations where there might be multiple business units is just because you define yourself as multiple business units, so insurance here, wealth management here, retail banking here, doesn't mean that I as a customer see you as three separate business units. I see you as one financial institution Treat me the same. Treat me with that lens. And so as we look at some of the, the detailed data, and I know I'm probably running short on time and I'm standing between lunch, um, it, it's interesting to see some of the, the differences here across the email, the direct mail, the inbound, uh, and the, the social media uh, that's really being used. And, and, and some of these slides will be available uh, following the presentation. Um, but, you know, if you look at, um, you know, some of the ones that are currently available versus those they're looking to add or expand in the next two years, how many of you feel like the next two years might be too late for some of those channels? Ooh, mood lighting. <laughs> it's also interesting to look at social media as not just an outbound, we're going to continue to push messages and hope that people read them and retweet them or like us on Facebook, it's really becoming about engagement um, in those channels. And so the, the interaction has the highest potential for growth within the next two years. So again, looking at those social media channels as customer service and customer engagement and ultimately customer satisfaction avenues. And so how can we really take our overall, wow, operational, <laughs> Okay, you guys are starting to freak me out now. Um, <laughs> how can we take those channels and how can we begin to ensure that we're optimizing those channels and driving people to the right channel based on what it has the best capacity to do for the customer and for the organization? And then, of course, can't forget text message. You know, if you're, uh, I recently saw the, the Gen Y guy, um, and he basically said, if you have anybody who's in Generation Y, any Gen Ys in the house? Oh, okay, few. So, so basically, this was the net net of what I learned. If you want to engage someone from Gen Y, text them. Text them. They don't answer phone calls, voicemails, kind of archaic. Um, 
I'm not saying that's true, <laughs> just what I was told. But I think as, as you start to see marketers indicating that those are areas um, to focus on and to increase exploration of, what you see there is the impact Gen Y is beginning to have on the marketplace in which we do business. Because they are the ones that are up and coming with the greater level of disposable income that continues to grow versus the other large segment of our population, the boomers, who at the, at the very front end are beginning to face you know, retirement, declining balances, fixed incomes. Um, you know, you're starting to see a shift in, okay, well, that's where the money is, and that's where the money is going to continue to grow for the next several decades. So how can we ensure we're capturing the maximum share of wallet from those folks? So I think that's really what speaks to the SMS and the social data that we're seeing there. A couple just case studies here, um, just to provide some illustrative um, examples of what other institutions uh, across the globe are doing. So BBVA is actually one of Spain's largest banks. They've actually employed, what's the best way to put this, almost like an automated teller, an, in an artificial intelligence teller in the bank that can interact with you and be contextual and relevant in real time, but they don't have a full functioning bank branch. These are kiosks, automated kiosks that you go to. Um, and they have begun to see their profits soar through the use of that. But they've also begun to see that their customer satisfaction is increasing as well through the, the use of these automated um, artificial intelligence tellers, I'll call them. We also see here as an example, American Express card holders um, in the UK can actually do some pretty cool stuff around um, geolocation-based offers, right? So right time, relevancy, context. So basically for American Express card holders in the UK that check into Foursquare, that allows them to receive right time geolocation-based offers. So if I check into a particular restaurant on Foursquare, Ooh, I might suddenly get a round of free martinis or a free appetizer. I'm in the moment. Of course I'm going to uptake that offer. But the uptake of that offer provides an opportunity and a realm of really rich data behind that. Sort of in a, in a similar vein, and this is one of my last slides, is Weave um, in the UK. And Weave in the UK is actually a consortium of the UK's three largest telcos. So imagine Bell, Rogers, Telus, um, and, and, and others getting together and saying, we're going to do something cooperatively. I don't know if that would happen here, but just saying. So they decided to band together cooperatively uh, to basically provide a mobile wallet to UK telecommunications customers. But that mobile wallet was more than just mobile payments. It was everything you can conceivably have within your own physical wallet that's in your back pocket or your purse. It's your credit cards, your ATM cards, it's your loyalty cards, it's your gift cards, it's your transit passes. All of that information stored and accessible to you, and a little scary, on your mobile device. So that's all you need to take with you. And you may say, well, gee, that's awfully nice of them. I wonder why they're doing that. So it's, it's, it's sort of phase one, this, this M commerce, this mobile commerce, um, that we're beginning to see spread globally, not quite epidemic proportions, but we're starting to see spread. And it's the war that I referred to earlier that I think is beginning to brew here in Canada between the telcos and the banks and who's going to own that data because ultimately what they're able to do the UK being relatively conservative and uh, regulation-based like we are with Castle, uh, is they're allowing people to opt in. So the opt-in provides not only permission to do the geolocation-based marketing, but it also ensures that the offers and the messages that you're extending via that mobile channel are relevant and of interest to a particular individual. So I think I'll just 
sort of summarize here, and then if we've got time for questions, we can go ahead and do that. So just in summary, from, a, from an overall omni-channel um, customer engagement perspective, it's really bringing in um, that overall customer uh, experience into the marketing lens uh, and ensuring that we have the robust customer information necessary to support the overall organizational goals and objectives that you all as marketers are being helped or asked to help achieve, right? And ensuring that you've got that information. There we go. It's also ensuring that you have the ability to analyze that information to ensure that you're doing the right thing at the right time in the right channel um, and that you're really beginning to ensure that the decisions are not only coordinated from a customer perspective across those operational channels, that omni-channel, uh, but it's also ensuring that you're, you're taking into um, account the overall customer experience and customer satisfaction goals that you're looking to achieve. Okay, are we good for time? I think that sort of concludes my, oh, <laughs> are you starving? You must be starving at this point. <laughs> oh, thank you, merci.